Thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Michael Warren. Um, today I'll be talking to you about uh, a series of projects that I've been working on about pesticides in the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest, ecosystem, or largest reef ecosystem in the world, exactly how bad the situation is in terms of pesticides, and is there anything that we can actually do to try and improve the situation. So this is the Great Barrier Reef. Runs basically from the tip down to about two thirds of uh, the way down Queensland. It's about two and a half thousand kilometres long, uh, and the total area that we're trying to manage uh, in, and make changes to is the land that's adjacent to that and the um, the ocean, and that comes to about seven hundred and eighty thousand square kilometres. When you think of the reef, this is what we like to think of: lovely, pristine conditions, uh, and some of it certainly is absolutely gorgeous. But this, just to give you an idea of how big it is, again, this is the, the reef itself, and we'll, I shouldn't stop touching it, the waters, and the land that drains to that, and that's where a lot of the pesticides, or all the pesticides are essentially coming from. So that area is about 10% of Australia, or about the size of England, of the UK and of France, or six England. So it's quite a large area. The, just like anywhere else in the world, there are a whole range of different stresses which are um, impacting on the reef. Some of them are shown here. Some of them are natural, cyclones, crown of thorns, starfish, coral bleaching. But the prevalence of those has been exacerbated uh, by human activities particularly climate change. There is also a range of very specific human activities which are having impacts on the barrel reef. Again, this is sort of what we like to think of, and it certainly is um, the case in many um, situations, but when rivers flood, the, the situation can be quite different. First of all, there's a lot of eroded sediments, but they also contain a cocktail, a complex cocktail of contaminants. So we have eroded soil, which is very clearly visible in this picture, but also nutrients from farmlands, a lot of fertilizer are, are applied. There's also a whole range of in, um, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and insecticides. And I'm sorry, but also a whole series of veterinary drugs, metals, endocrine disruptors, um, our pharmaceuticals that we use, etc. So there's a lot of different contaminants being discharged out to the Great Barrier Reef from these rivers, which basically are draining uh, and transporting the land-based activities out to the reef. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about a number of projects. The first one is about a retrospective risk assessment, and that's what most risk assessments are because you've got the information about the contamination, but that contamination has already occurred. So you're always estimating the risk of what's happened. And then we're looking at a, another study where we're actually doing a predictive risk, so um, to, to the future, or at least to the present, where we don't have information, and then an extension of that work. Another project where we're trying to provide farmers and people who use um, pesticides and provide advice on that, actually some information to help them make better decisions to use pesticides which are less, har less harmful to the environment. Uh, then I'll quickly run through um, some work on the temporal trends of imidacloprid. You may well know about imidacloprid, it's a particularly nasty, well, um, it's been uh, in implicated in the um, decline of bee colonies throughout the world. Um, so having a look at the trends there. Um, and then some multiple factors, so not just looking at one factor at a time or one stressor at a time, but looking at multiple stressors and how to deal with those. So, I'll move on to the first study. Um, this was actually started while I was here in, um, earlier, and it's a master's student's uh, work by Francis Spilsbury. And basically what he's doing here is trying to do a retrospective risk assessment. And he had data for 3,800 3, samples 
from 17 different waterways um, uh, for over five years. So it's quite a decent data set. These set water samples were analysed for 50 different pesticides and some pesticide metabolites. And the way that he used or calculated the risk that the pesticides pose to aquatic ecosystems is called the risk quotient method. And I'll just very briefly run through this with you. It's a very simple method. So basically, if you're looking at trying to work out the risk for an individual pesticide or an individual chemical, the risk quotient, RQ, is simply the concentration of that chemical in any, in any water sample divided by the water quality guideline, or which is the safe concentration of that chemical. So if this number is greater than the safe concentration, obviously it's not safe. So if you get a value of greater than one, it's indicating there's a problem. If it's less than one, it's indicating that it's safe. Safe, okay? Um, and for mixtures, it's very, very similar. What you're doing is simply summing up the, uh, the RQ values for all the individual chemicals that are in a particular sample, okay? So RQ sum, the, risk, the sum of the risk quotients, simply the sum of the, sorry, Concentrations divided by the water quality guideline for each chemical or each pesticide in your samples. And so you just sum them up. And I've summarized what I've told you already what that how to interpret that. Now one of the things uh, when you actually look at the plots which come next is it's important to understand is that if the RQ, as I said, is more than one, or the RQ sum is more than one, yes, it indicates there's a risk, but that is a linear scale. So if we get an RQ of a value of 10, it does not mean biologically it's 10 times worse. What it means is simply the concentration is 10 times higher than the water quality guideline. Okay? And that's and there's a difference between the concentration and the biological effects because the ratio, the, the relationship between um, the number of species or the biological effect and concentration is not linear. Okay. So just because a value is ten doesn't mean it's ten times worse biologically than a value of one. So you just need to sort of keep that in your mind. But it certainly means it's worse. So, with all those 3,800 3, samples, what he did was he calculated the risk quotient for all the mixtures of pesticides in every single sample in all of those rivers, and he's plotted that out. So here you have time on this axis, and you have the risk quotient here. The red line is a value of one, so where it, I obviously keep touching the screen, I'm sorry. Where the values are stop below one, it's safe. Above one, it's not. And you can see here that the values go, I'm not touching that, maybe I should at least. That it goes up to 10, but they actually go off scale quite a bit further. And you can see that here by the color coding. So as they go from dark blue towards yellow, green, red, that's a higher value. And some of them, you can see these red ones, are at least 50. So that means we have quite a lot of our samples at all these uh, rivers which are potentially saying that we would be expecting biological effects to be occurring. Uh, and they are many times higher than the safe concentration. This is plotting the same sort of information in a slightly different way. So that each one of these dots represents a sample. So here we have, for the various rivers, the risk quotient to the log of those values for, um, for each site over the five years. And so it gives you actually a feel of the variation in that in any one site. The red line here, again, is the risk quotient of one. So safe, some effects would be expected. 
The red line here is the median and the black line is the mean. mean sorry. So you can see that there are a number of sites where the vast majority of the values are above an RQ of 1 and therefore we would be, we would be expecting biological effects. But for every single river, even ones where the mean and the median are below, there are there is the odd sample where it's sufficiently high that we would be expecting some biological effects. Here we only have like one or three maybe, and here we probably have 75 or 80 percent of the samples we would be expecting to cause biological effects. This is these sort of ends are clearly these rivers are clearly worse than those ones. <coughs> Here, what he then did was he actually looked at the samples, the water samples, and um, worked at how many pesticides were in each one of those. And this is a human frequency plot of that. So here we have the number of samples, and here we have the number of pesticides that were in the various samples. And as you can see clearly, the vast majority of the um, water quality samples had five or less pesticides. And as the number of pesticides in per sample increases, there are less and less of those. But nonetheless, you can see that up to 23 pesticides were found in any one sample, which is quite a lot. Um, so what that clearly shows is that <coughs> virtually all the pesticides, or sorry, all the, virtually all the water quality samples, apart from this 300 and maybe 20 odd samples, have 3,800 contain at least one pesticide. And this is zero, so that's one pesticide, this is two. So from here on in, they're mixtures of pesticides. So what it's telling us is the vast majority of all those samples, there are pesticide mixtures present. <clears throat> then what he did was he's actually looked at the relative contribution of each pesticide to the toxicity of the, the, the toxicity of the mixture of, uh, that's in the sample. And so here we have uh, the pesticides which contribute the most to each mixture, and that's diuron. So over all those samples, diuron is contributing on average 45% of the toxicity of the mixtures. Roughly 50% if you like. Then imidacloprid is contributing another 25%. So those two chemicals in their own right are basically contributing roughly 75% of the toxicity of all those 300 or 3,800 samples. And as you go this way, each of the pesticides is contributing on average less and less. But if you look at these first five, diuron, a herbicide, dimidacloprid, a pesticide, atrazine, a pesticide, a uh, herbicide, which many of you, you will know about, metolachlor, another herbicide, and hexazinone, just with those five pesticides, you are accounting for more than 90% of the toxicity of the mixtures. And so when we first presented this to one of the policy people, they went, that is great. So we only have to control these five herbicides, these five pesticides, and really the whole, the rest of it will be sorted because we're taking, taking into account 90% of the pesticides, the toxicity. And we went, no, that's not right. That's not exactly right. Um, but we couldn't actually give them an answer straight away. And so it was one of those questions which was very fortunate because it actually made us do more work and gave us bigger insight into it. And this next graph is a bit yucky, and it's very complex, but um, I'll explain it a bit. Basically, for all of the pesticides there that we have here, we have the number as distribution of their relative ranking of how much they're contributing to the toxicity. So the bigger the spread, the more variable is they are in terms of their their position in terms of their contribution. But it's still clear that diuron, because it's closest here, is generally the most toxic. It's rank one, okay? And if you look here, you might be able to see a fine white line. 
So that's the line of five. So the top, anything which has a distribution which is between here and here is contributing in some of those samples to the most toxic five. And when you actually look at that, there are 23 different pesticides which are in those 3,800 are actually the are contributing as the most toxic five. So unfortunately, their simplification doesn't quite work. It's not that simple. It is correct that on average, those over five, five pesticides do contribute the most, but those five actually is hardly very little, and it's 23 different pesticides will contribute and be that top five most important five. So the unfortunate um, simplification that they were looking for is not in fact the correct. Um, but nonetheless, it's still very useful information. So this was a retrospective risk assessment. It was looking backwards because this, this exposure had already happened. And what we're doing in this next uh, assessment is to actually um, be able to predict. Uh, and we wanted to be able to predict the toxicity of the toxicity of mixtures of up to 23 different um, pesticides. A couple of key reasons for this. We've detected up to 50 different pesticides going out to the Great Barrier Reef. The vast majority of them are in mixtures. So if we don't deal with mixtures, we're underestimating the toxicity. And another key driver for this project was that we now have as part of the process for trying to protect the reef, we have a series of water quality guidelines, land sorry, and land management guidelines. But in terms of pesticides, this is the target. So at the end of the rivers, the goal is to protect at least 99% of species. Okay? And the other thing is that, that we have reef and regional report codes which report on progress towards those targets. So every time a report come, card comes out, it's saying what progress has been made to achieving these various targets. And so what we actually needed to be able to do was we needed to have a starting point to say, actually, okay, well, this is where we are now. And in order to say, well, actually, we've made this much progress or this much, this much, to towards the target. Okay, so this project was about determining this baseline. What is the level of risk from pesticides at the moment? And we had to do this predictive process because we only have monitoring sites, although it's a very big uh, monitoring program, at something like 38 rivers. There are 970 waterways which go out to the Great Barrier Reef. Some of them are really tiny, but nonetheless, we don't. We will never have information for what pesticides are in all those rivers that are going out there. So we need to have a predictive methodology. We could have used the risk quotient method, which I explained in the previous methodology. But what we chose to use is this: the multi-substance potentially affected fraction which is a, an awfully complicated thing to keep saying time and time again. So we always abbreviate that to ms -CAF. The reason we chose that particular method is um, it's an established method, so we didn't have to do it from scratch. It uses species sensitivity distributions, which I'll come to in a minute. And the important bit is there that it expresses the result as a percentage of species that is affected. And therefore, it's directly comparable to the target that we have. Also, that um, expressing the risk in terms of the percentage of species that are protected or affected is directly comparable to the Australian and New Zealand water quality guidelines and also the EU frameworks that you have, guidelines you have here. So it's fitting into an existing structure and framework which people understand. Now, an SSD is a species sensitivity distribution, and it's really just a cumulative frequency 
of the sensitivity of species to atroxin. So here, what this is saying is this is the least uh, least tolerant, the most sensitive species, because the lowest concentration will start to affect it, and this is the most tolerant species. So this is our cumulative frequency. And basically, you can use these in two different ways. You can estimate the concentration that should protect any chosen percentage of species. So in essence, you're using your SSD and going, okay, well, I want to protect and you select the percentage of species that you want to protect. In essence, you go across, draw a line, and now it always does it mathematically, not with um, pencils and stuff, and draws down. And you can work out the concentration that should protect any chosen percentage of species. Or you can use these in exactly the reverse way. You can actually estimate the percentage of species that should be protected when you have a selected concentration, such as the concentration in a water sample. In that case, you're using exactly the opposite way. You might say, well, we've got 10 micrograms per litre of um, a pesticide or chemical, and that corresponds here, and that will protect X percent of species. And that's what we're doing in this particular method, because we have information about the concentration of the pesticides, so for each pesticide, we can get the SSD and we can estimate for that sample what percentage of species should be protected just because of that pesticide. And then for each pesticide in your water sample that are in that mixture, we combine those up together and then we can estimate the risk associated with the pesticides in that mixture. So we had to work out which pesticides we're actually going to include. As I said before, there are 50 different pesticides that have been detected, um, but it was that was to be a very big um, thing to do. So we narrowed it down somewhat. We selected 22 pesticides. The reasoning behind the selection was, well, first of all, they had to be registered for use in Australia, and we wanted to focus on those which were most relevant. So we pick the ones which were regularly detected in the um, catchments and out, out on the reef. And basically this ended up with these 22. Um, they might not mean very much to a lot of you, but they're, um, they're the active ingredients, the chemicals which actually give the pesticides their killing or inhibiting powers. The vast majority of those are herbicides, so designed to inhibit or kill plants. Some of those, um, Mitocopid, uh, etc. Are three of those are insecticides designed to kill insects. Importantly, at this stage, we didn't have any uh, concentration data on fungicides, so there are no fungicides included. So obviously, that's a whole group which is just not accounted for at all in this. We had data for thirty-six different sites over three years. Because we're trying to establish the baseline, sort of like what's happening now, we used the most recent year's data. We didn't just use one year's data because it's, it can be quite variable, so we wanted to sort of get a bit of an average feel. But nonetheless, we chose the most recent years we had data for. Unfortunately, we didn't have data for all sites at all years, um, but nonetheless, we still had 80, or sorry, 68 unique data sets that we could work with. So, we were trying to develop um, methods which could ex estimate the risk where we had water quality monitoring data, but also to estimate risks where we didn't have data. Okay, so we were trying to we were trying to develop some models, simple models, and then use those to predict the effects elsewhere. These are the types of relationships that we were trying to develop. Somewhere where we could have, we had the pesticide mixture toxicity using the method I briefly outlined before, and then we wanted to relate it to okay, some variables. And we used three different types of variables. The percent land use in the catchment above the monitoring site. So we express it as a percentage, so what percentage is used for uh, growing uh, sugarcane, what's for grazing, what's urban, etc. 
We looked at hydrological features and spatial features. And then we use either forward and backwards, uh, li uh, not linear, stepwise regression. Uh, it could be linear, it could be transformed, it could be nonlinear. It didn't really matter. We were just trying to get relationships which fitted the data. These are the actual variables that we used. So here are the land use variables. As you can see, they're predominantly about agriculture because that is the main land use in the catchments that we're monitoring. But we also included urban because there are, they're not really cities, towns, although I'll probably get in trouble if I go back up there and say it's not a city. Um, the amount that's actually water, what's wetland, and other uses. We also gave some hydrological variables, you know, about how much rainfall there is, what's the soil moisture content, and how much runoff at these, um, in these patches. And we also put some, some site specific information. Um, long, latitude, longitude, the AMTD, I always forget the actual, what it, what it stands for, but it basically is a measure of the distance from the river mouth to where the site, the monitoring site is. And the reason we included that is we felt that if the site was above the tidal reach, then it would, that might affect it, the concentrations compared to the river mouth where you have the tidal influence going in and out, so it might be a lot more diluted. So we wanted to include that. We included the size of the catchments as well, because that might affect concentrations. When you're developing these types of models, you we're going to be developing multiple parameter uh, relationships. You should not be using variables which are correlated to each other. That's all that correlation. So the very first thing that we did was to work out what was correlated to what. And based on that, we eliminated the whole of variables and said, well, um, so these dark blue ones are highly correlated. We couldn't put in a relationship where, which um, had two highly correlated parameters. This gives you an example of the type of relationship that we developed. So this is for predicting the total toxicity of those 22 pesticides. And these are the variables that we found gave us a good fit. So using those variables, those land use variables, and these coefficients, we could explain 77% of the variation in the mixture toxicity across our sites. And you can see that they're all very highly significant, so uh, it's valid to include them in a relationship. Now, whenever you develop models, you need to validate them. Anyone who does modeling knows this. So what we had, remember I said we had 68 unique data sets earlier on? We used two thirds of those, which were randomly selected as the training set to develop these relationships. And then we used one third, again, which were randomly selected as the validation set. So once we have the, the equation that we just had there, when we go to validate it, what we do is we put in the, the values for the other sites, which are in the validation set, and then we predict these estimates here. And although they're not perfect, when you're considering the, um, the fact that we're doing this over you know, 2,500 kilometres, very, very variable climatic conditions, etc., we felt very we felt relieved and confident we, to proceed with these relationships. We didn't just do it, do it for the total toxicity of all 22, we also broke it down and developed individual relationships for key groups of pesticides. So one key group is what we call PS2 herbicides, photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides. They have a very specific mode of action, they block a special part of the photosynthetic process. Other herbicides which can have a range of different means and insecticides. And the reason we did total and then break them down is that we wanted to get more information. Um, particularly what we wanted to be able to say is if we, if the model comes up and says, well, this is quite a risky site, well, that's fine if we just did on totals. But then the immediate question that someone would ask is, well, which pesticides are the ones that are really causing the problem? Logical question. So we, by having these, 
subsets, if you like, you could actually say, well, it's the photosynthesis PS2 ones, or it's insecticides, etc. So those relationships were for the individual rivers where we had monitoring data. And as I explained before, we were trying to predict the toxicity for rivers where we didn't have any data at all. And we also wanted to predict it at the regions. So down here you have all the rivers, and then we have what we call natural resource management regions. There are six which make up the land next to the Great Barrier Reef. So we wanted to be able to estimate the pesticide mixture as if we had a single river draining each of those rivers, regions, and discharging out. And we wanted to give an estimate for the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. I'm sorry. Um, and so what we have obviously had to do was we had to scale up our relationships, which were for individual um, rivers, to uh, um, these NRM regions, which can contain multiple regions, uh, rivers, and then to the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. And the reason we could do that is we used variables which were scalable, and they are not generally not unique to a specific site. So, if we want to, if we had, if we want to develop a relationship for Burnett and Mary, get an estimate for that. All we need to do is say. What is the percentage land use within that whole region? And we have that information. When we want to estimate for the Great Barrier Reef, we look at the total or the percentage land use for all the land that um, is drained to the Great Barrier Reef. So that's what we mean by scaling up the relationships. <clears throat> and then we use these exactly the same relationships, but rather than putting in the information for individual rivers, we put in the land uses for the region, that specific region, or the whole of the roof. Okay? Now, <clears throat> normally you would try and validate any relationships, but we, we're predicting where we have no data. So obviously we can't actually validate it. So what we did is what we call ground truth. Just see if you like, if it makes sense. The way we did that was, okay, so we looked at our predictions uh, for rivers where we didn't have data, or for the basins and for the whole of the GBR. And what we did was we said, okay, well, what's the land use in that river or the region? Um, and we would look back to the rivers where we actually had monitoring data and we had their land use. And we would find rivers which matched as closely as possible the same percentage land use, etc. And then we would go, okay, does that make sense? If we've got this very similar levels, we would expect um, similar land uses, would we expect similar um, degrees of, well, we would expect similar pesticide risk. And that's how we checked them, to see if they made sense. <coughs> and by and large, they did, which is good. So this is what we ended up with. These are the predicted percent of species that would be protected at the GDR level. It's 97%. So it's not meeting the target, which was to protect 99% of species. So in the long term, or in the future, there has to be an improvement of 2% protection. Then we did it for each of the six regions, which you can see here. You can see Cape York is currently already meeting the um, the target, and that's basically because in Cape York, there's basically, it's natural. There's very little like agriculture, there's virtually no towns. It's about as pristine as you can get. But as you can see in other regions, they still have some progress to make. This one stands out on COVID Sundays. Clearly they uh, have uh, a much worse situation our estimate is that there are, the waters discharged from there are only protecting 81% of the species. So, quite a few percent of species are potentially being impacted. We also made predictions for rivers where we didn't have data, and some of those predictions are shown here. But what I want to emphasize is this data over here, which, remember I said we did these other groupings because it would allow us to 
get a feel for which group of bacillus was um, having contributing most to the toxicity. And that's what you can see here, the different colourings correspond to that. So the Dane tree, even though it's a very clean, any impact is associated with insecticides. For these yellow rivers, the, it's predominantly to do with PS2s, although the other herbicides do have a good contribution. For the green ones, it's predominantly the other herbicides which are causing the toxicity. And for this uh, ochre one, it's pretty much even between the PS2s and other herbicides. Because some people are much more visual, particularly policy people and ministers, etc., who like simple um, information to be given to them, we develop uh, visual maps which are just colour coded so you can see both the uh, risk. Dark green is very low risk. Uh, light green is a low risk. And then it goes you know, yellow, amber, up to red. And so you can see for the individual uh, catchments, rivers, and for the regions, what the risk is. And that's the risk map for total pesticides, for the 22 pesticides all combined. And we had map maps also for the three breakout groups as well. So these findings have been published in two reports. <coughs> these are sort of the um, big picture sort of level reports. There's a detailed technical report which I'm finalising now, and there will be a paper arriving, arising from that. But importantly, as far as I'm concerned, is it's not that's just not information, it's actually being used. So all those predictions have been incorporated as the baseline into the reef report card. So um, we have that's uh, yeah. it's on the reef report card. There are interactive maps which then show people what the baseline prediction is, and it does it for individual rivers, and that's uh, four rivers in the Mackay with Sundays region. That's the uh, predicted risk for the Mackay with Sundays, and this is for the other regions, and this is the risk value for the reef overall. And it's very, um, it's easy to sort of go, oh, well, it's 97%. We're not doing too badly. We don't really have a problem. But the, as you, you know, go back up to a higher level, that is true. Overall, it, the situation is not too bad in terms of pesticide at a gross level. But as these subsequent values and even more site-specific, smaller spatial scale values show you, Yes, overall it might be okay, but at smaller scales, the risk can actually be really high. So that's why it's really important not to just give the big picture, but to give this finer spatial scale information. Because yes, it's overall it's okay, but if you've got 70% of your species being protected, roughly a, 30, roughly a third of them are going to be experiencing some effects, according to our predictions, that is not a good situation at all. So locally, the situation would be quite different. What we then did is we had a master's student, Aisha al from Oman, and she basically, we said, we need even smaller spatial scale information. So she went away and collected all the information we needed for those models, <coughs> for 170 different catchments, and some of them were really quite small, like, 100 square kilometers. And she then used those models to predict the risk to those 170 different catchments and ended up with this risk map. And the, as you can see, the detail on that is far greater. So we have a much greater spatial resolution of information uh, to provide to people when they actually go to sort of try and interact with farmers, etc., and explain the situation. In terms of the future for this particular project, what we want to do is include more pesticides, particularly fungicides, because we're, they're just, we have no idea. And uh, in the tropical regions, as you can imagine, you, you have hot, moist conditions. It's fabulous for fungi and things like that. 
So, for example, we know in the banana industry, they apply fungicides every two weeks. Every two weeks they have to apply it because it's rained on it and why fungicides have gone. Where have they gone? They've gone in our rivers. So, Lord knows what's happening there. Interestingly, you need to take into account and think about indirect effects. And it was really interesting, there was a study done here in Europe where they found fungus, uh, increased use of fungicides was closely aligned with the decline of bee colonies. Now, first people went, fungicides causing bee deaths? That doesn't make sense. They're designed specifically to kill fungi. What the hell's that? Mean? And eventually they found out that the fungi, uh, the fungicide, sorry, was suppressing fungi, and it was a particular fungi which in turn parasitized a parasite of the bees. So by inhibiting that, it meant more of the parasites could parasitize the bees and therefore the bee colonies were um, collapsed. So we've also got to think just not about linear things. We've got to look about indirect. I'd really like to get a prediction for every single river that goes out to the GBR. Not sure how, how likely that is. But um, what this is really showing to us um, because there's a big pushback, as you can imagine. We're sort of making these estimates and people going, nah, I don't see that. Look, my river, I go fishing there every, every day or every weekend, it's fine. I don't see any biological harm. So we're predicting quite marked biological effects should be occurring, and they're sort of saying, I don't see it. Then maybe they're not seeing what it was. What they're seeing is what it is now. So this is becoming increasingly important. We've got to actually start doing large-scale biological monitoring and biological assessment in these rivers. And that's a project that I'm now working on to really do it from you know, genomics, um, subcellular, um, individual and population and community level effects right across and at, across the whole of the reef. Okay. So what is one of the things that we can, in fact, do to try and turn this situation around? We've been saying to the farmers um, and industry for a while, pesticides are causing problems, you know, in some quite spatial, confined spatial areas, and they all go, which is fair enough, well, what do you want us to do? And governments will go, mm -hmm, I don't know. Um, so what this project had was about, or is about, is to provide information to everyone who's associated with using pesticides, the farmers, the sellers, the agronomists and the extension officers who provide advice to the farmers about what should be applied, so that they can actually make a choice, which is not just about, is it the appropriate pesticide for my, the pest that I've got to deal with, and the cost, but actually what's also the environmental impact, or potential environmental impact. And so we were collating all that information together, and given the audience who aren't, um, you know, these are these are these are bright people. There's no doubt about that. But they're not experts in the sort of fields that you need to have. And in order for it to be useful, it's got to be relatively simple, so that they could um, use it. So that was a key um, characteristic. Obviously, it wasn't to be scientifically incredibly complex because then it would just simply become a not usable tool for them. Interestingly for me, I had to do a whole lot of stakeholder meetings, which was, as a scientist, was interesting. <laughs> um, some of these were individual meetings with going to the farmer's shed, and the farmers had their the, uh, surrounding farmers together, and there might be me and six people just sitting down in the farm's shed, having a beer and chatting about this project. I was quite intimidated, to say the least, up to, to, at the beginning, thinking I'm going to be really heavily criticised. But um, once the rapport was developed, it actually was a very fruitful um, interaction. I learned a heck of a lot from them about how things are actually done, which actually made the tool a much more useful tool, and they got, they got very significant input into it. So, what did we do? We, it was only for the sugarcane industry because they're very tightly, um, they've been sort of fingers being pointed at them and saying, you are a major culprit in terms of the pesticides that are going out to the reef. So, 
this project was aimed specifically at them. So we, the project has addressed all the active ingredients in the pesticides which are registered for use on uh, sugarcane. Okay, so it's included all of those. It's also included a couple of other chemicals um, which are associated with use of sugarcane. But importantly, we didn't include any of the additives that are in commercial formulations. The main reason for that is simply very little is known about those. It's commercial uh, impropriety information, so it's not readily available. And anyway, in order to um, include their toxicity, we actually need to have toxicity data for that. It's not available as a generalisation. So we just focused on the active ingredients for all the products which can be applied to sugarcane. Now, you all know this, but it's important to just step back from it. Just because a pesticide is applied to soil or to a crop doesn't mean it's going to be a risk to aquatic ecosystems. There has to be some vector or transport means to actually get it into the waterways. That is usually rainfall. So when rainfall occurs, you can either get, either get surface runoff into the waterways or it can go down and become subsurface or if it goes down even further, groundwater and then that can merge with surface waters. So the transport of the pesticides is a really key, important point. Once they're in the waterways, things like the concentration and their, their persistence are also important characteristics. So this is sort of what we had to sort of think about, you know, going from a science you really want to be into the minutiae and the detail, and then for this to be useful, we have to step back and go, well, what is really important to give general advice? So, after all those consultations, etc., what we ended up was essentially this. It's a, just a graph and a table, and I'll explain the graph first. So it's got two axes. Here is relative measure of effect, which is simply the application rate, so how much they can legally apply to their soil, divided by an estimate of the toxicity, which is the water quality guideline. So how safe, what concentration is safe? And then we express that value relative to the least toxic. So of all the 48 active ingredients, Veloxifop was the least toxic. So it was normalized to a value of one. Chlorpyrifos was the most toxic because of either its large application rate or it's incredibly toxic. But the way you read this is because it's a logarithmic scale, is basically chlorpyrifos is roughly 1,000 million times worse in terms of potential toxic effects than haloxifol. So in terms of picking a better chemical, better active ingredient, down is good. The other key factor we were looking at was mobility, because that is what transports it from the farmland into the waterways. And again, we did exactly the same thing. The mobility it was expressed relative to the least mobile, which was dicot dibromide, so it gets a value of one. And as you go across this way, it's getting more and more mobile, more easily transported into water, groundwater, or onto surface water. So a value of, just trying to get something that's nice and easy. Wow. Um, uh, yes, here. Flu fl flousy fog is roughly 1,000 times more mobile than dicot dibromide. Okay, so that's all that information condensed there onto that one plot. And basically, this, as you move in this direction, it's better because it's less mobile, less likely to get into waterway. As you move that way, it's more mobile, worse. And on this axis, as you go this way, it's more likely to actually cause toxic effects if it gets into the waterway. And this way, it's less likely. So when you combine all that, moving up is worse, and moving that way is worse. So anything. Anything that's in an upward or a, a, a moving to the right is the worst choice. 
having some problems with. And I give it back. You can touch the spine. Touch the spine. No. And any, and if you're comparing choices, anything that is to the left and down, that sort of direction, is a better choice. But sometimes your choices may not be exactly following that. Some of them might be down and over to the right. In which case, you're sort of going, well, it's less toxic, but it's more mobile. Which is the key characteristic? Does that make it better at all? And that's where this table comes in. And it's basically the product of the relative, to uh, relative mobility and the re this measure of toxicity. So the bigger this number is, the worse it is in terms of the environment. So it's more toxic and it's more mobile, basically. So if you've got this situation um, where you, yes, it might be less toxic, but it's more mobile, you can simply look at these values to determine which is the better product. So if we had this, for example, our, our product for insecticides, Say we were currently using caducifos. So if you've got your farm, we're currently using caducifos to control a particular pest, an insect. And then the other options are shown here. So as I said before, anything that's in a downward and to the left direction is a better product for the aquatic environment. Okay? It's going to have less harmful effects. So bifenthrin, permethrin, fibronel, that would be good choices. I would be encouraging the farmers to pick those. But imidacloprid is much less toxic than caducifos. Well, it helps if we have a lot of caducifos, but it is slightly more mobile. <coughs> which is, does that still make it better overall? You can't determine that visually from the graph. You can if you can really do convert log units, etc. But it's simpler just to go here. Go caducifos, risk of 200,000 million compared to imidacloprid of only 2,100 million. So it's much better in midi-clover. It's a lower risk. So that's how we um, envisage people using it, the farmers and the other uh, sellers, etc., all felt comfortable with that. And the idea is that basically th this will go out as a poster. So every farmer will have this as a poster on their farm shed wall so they can look at it make, and help make those decisions. It would go up on the wall of the resellers, etc. But as you can imagine, with a poster, you can only deal with one, in essence, one sort of fixed scenario. And in the real world, there's always, they're always tweaking things, etc. So what we did was we developed a, a simple Excel spreadsheet whereby they could change the application rate because they don't always apply it at the maximum application rate. Some will do it at half, the neighbor next door might do it 75 because he reckons that, that's much more effective, you know. They also make tank mixes. So typically when they're spraying, they don't just have one pest they're trying to spray with. They might be trying to control some weed, but they've also got some insects problems as well. So they're fun by the they create their own tank mixes. And they also have different spray regimes. So we needed to take that into account. So with this spreadsheet, you can do deal with all of these things. Broad acre is when you're basically spraying the whole paddock or your whole farm. Fan spraying, is a really good process. Um, it's, the pesticides are very directed. Um, and basically you use, to cover the same area, you typically use 10 to 30% of the same amount as you do with broad acre. So it's just going exactly where you need it. It's not spraying and wasting a whole lot. And spot spraying is like, okay, you say, okay, well there I've got a problem. I'm just going to spray that 10 square meters or 100 square meters. You don't spray the rest. And so we did that. It's a very simple process. It's got a whole series of drop down menus. And when you select things, anything else, any of the other um, active ingredients that you haven't selected just disappears. Once you've made all your corrections to make it suit your, what you're planning to do, then the software regenerates the graph for the ones that you've actually chosen, regenerates this uh, risk. So that you have that information and you very easily can then make decisions about your choices. So if they want, if they're currently using Amatrim, the other options are these, and they can use the graph or they can use this 
to help make them uh, help them make more informed choices, which would be better for the environment. Now, obviously, this is only one part of their decision. Cost is really important, but it's surprising the number of farmers who say, "Oh, well, I'm actually glad about that, um, you know, and I'm willing to pay extra money to use a lower risk product." Now, I'm not saying they're going to say pay twice as much, but they were saying, "Yeah, well, twenty percent more." That you know, that sort of margin, that would be quite acceptable. So, it's 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 interesting. I think there is quite a lot of scope for, and the farmers and the resellers, etc., are really keen. They really want this product out there. One of the other things we were supposed to do was we were supposed to look at whether or not an app type version, one which would be farms and soil specific, would be useful. And at first, all the farmers were like, "Yeah, we really want an app. We don't want the poster. You know, just no, 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 no." But as it went on, and they actually saw. The sort of, as it evolved and we got this sort of product that I've just shown you there, they really liked that because they had discussions with it. <clears throat> and what they actually decided was actually the most uh, more useful was rather than going to an app, was actually to develop, to further expand the decision support tool to actually include all the active ingredients in the pesticides that they use for the crops that are grown in rotation with sugar cane. So when you grow sugar cane, in Australia at least, you don't just grow sugar cane. You will rotate that with other crops. Peanuts, soybean, mung beans, and cotton is another one. But they do rotate them. And obviously those other crops have different pesticides which can be applied to them. And therefore there are different pesticides which are being applied to that land and getting out to the rivers. So the, they actually came and argued that no, not an app. Let's expand this out to include all the pesticides that they potentially be using. So we've actually now just put in a bid to do exactly that as part of a Project Blue Water one. A Project Blue Water, we put in a bid for two and a half million, and about 150,000 will go towards expanding the, um, the pesticide decision support to. Talking quickly about the Uniclopid, remember it's been implicated as a very harmful pesticide insecticide in terms of bee colony decline. There are a number of properties that it has, such as high apiary solubility, high leaching potential, and high persistence in the environment, which is sort of ensure that it's very, very frequently detected in surface and groundwater. Good going? So. Oh, wow. um, it has been banned in all that sort of use within the EU because of these properties and because of the uh, links to bee colony decline. Still in use in Australia, although we're currently <coughs> just about to commence a review of the Midicope use. We looked at over 5,000 samples for these years and we analysed them for a Midicope. We detected in Uncopin roughly half the samples. And the other key point that I really want to bring to your attention is that, so the PC99 is that, you know, they are targeted protecting 99% of species at the end of the riverways. Roughly a quarter of the samples would not meet that. And that's in terms of Uncopin all by itself, not taking into account that there are other pesticides in all those samples. So a quarter of those samples, we would be expecting some unacceptable level of biological effects. And 10% of those samples would potentially be affecting 5% of species without accounting for any other pesticide present, being present. What we found was that where we had bananas and sugarcane growing, we had a much higher level of frequency, uh, uh, much higher frequency detecting the midclopid. And in fact, we could predict the 95th percentile and the maximum midclopid in terms of the percent of the catchment that is used to grow sugarcane and bananas. These are some of the trends that we found for a mid-cloprid <coughs> over time. So this is, on this axis, is the percentage of species that are predicted to be affected. So up here at 100 is good, down is worse. And as you can see, it's slowly getting worse. This is typical for those rivers 
Um, this is another example which is even worse because there's more, more samples which are being collected which are not acceptable and the level of, at which the, the degree of protection is getting worse as well over time. So they're getting lower levels of protection and more samples are giving them those sort of levels of protection. Some sort of just got worse and stabilised. It's not really getting further worse, but still, at the worst, it's roughly 80% of this species potentially being infected. One glimmer of hope is Barata Creek. It actually got quite bad, but it then steadily recovered. Um, there are a whole series of reasons for why we could be getting these changes in the COVID concentration, and they are listed here. But basically, we've looked at all of those and we've ruled them out. And if they're not contributing to this, um, we did have a change in the analytical methods. So, as you, if you remember what's Little Britain, you'll know this lady, you go here, but no, but here, but no. Um, but ultimately, we certainly do have, did have analytical changes. So, we looked at that, but it did not ultimately lead to the cause of the changes in that immediate um, concentrations. Another possibility is that flow was actually affecting the immunocopin concentrations, but there, again, there's no correlation, and the answer is no, which basically left us with the option, as we thought it was, that there was increased use of immunocopin over time. In particular, what we think was happening is that um, it came off patent, and a lot of uh, generic forms of uh, immunoglobin became available, and at the same time, there was this word of mouth going happening whereby uh, it was recommended that you should apply immunoglobin to control this yellow canopy syndrome. It's an unidentified syndrome that basically all the tops of the sugarcane go yellow, and you get much lower yields of sugarcane. And this word of mouth was saying, well, if you apply immunoglobin, which is designed to kill cane grub, an insect, it will prevent the um, yellow canopy syndrome occurring. So they were trying to use it in a, a bit like taking vitamin C to ward off colds, in a prophylactic um, a preventative approach. And that's when we think, that's when the immunoglobin concentrations started down to the roof. I'll go very, very briefly over these. Water quality guide, water quality is not just occurring by itself. So we have these water quality guidelines which indicate our safe levels, but as you know through climate change, we have increasing ocean, oceanic temperatures. So what we did here was we've actually developed a new method so that we could actually uh, combine those two effects because we're already behind the angle and there's very, very little in literature about the combined effects of temperature and uh, toxicity. And we're really never going to really have all the information that we need. So we needed a method to try and combine the information about the effects of toxicity and the information about the effects of temperature into a single method. And we did that. Um, that's just been approved, um, accepted in es &T. But basically, what it, what we were able to do is quantify the effect on if you had a thermal tolerance value, how much it would have to decrease if you had um, varying concentrations of two best, uh, two chemicals, diiron and copper. And we did it the other way: if you have increasing temperature, what's how much does the water quality guideline have to be further lowered in order to give the degree of protection that you are wanting. And this finally, it's the very last thing. <clears throat> um, I have a PhD student who's just started, she's about nine months into her project, and she's going to be looking at the combined and, uh, effect of multiple stresses on seagrasses. Specifically, she's looking at the effects of, inter of, of temperature, uh, reduced light, and exposure to herbicides. Um, and a lot of people, when they think of uh, Great Barrier Reef or reefs in general, think only of coral. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Particularly in the Great Barrier Reef, um, seagrasses are an incredibly important ecosystem as well. 
And basically what she's going to do is a whole lot of the, um, the biological experiments where she looks at the effects of each of those stresses, the increased light, um, increased temperature, decreased light from increased suspended solids going out in the rivers and exposure to pesticides to individually and then in combination of the two stresses and then combination of all three stresses and test them for microalgae, you get single celled algae, but also for seagrasses. And from that, she'll develop an, an, an interaction model. So, at what concentration and what light intensity do we, and so on, do we get changes? And it'll be for single, multiple, uh, double, and tr the three stresses together. Then, what she's going to do is we have maps of the presence of sea grasses. We all also have this model called Elix, which actually models the flow of water from the river mouths out and where it goes out in the Great Barrier Reef. So with the information from the monitoring that, that I'm sort of talking to you about, we will know about, and then using that, plugging that data into the models, we will get maps of this. So, so of the area that's affected by sediment, the area where you're getting herbicide, it increased exposure to herbicides, and temperature. And having that information that she will generate from the experiments, she would be able to predict, you know, here it's only the effect of increased temperature, so she can give you the estimate of the effects on seagrasses, but equally where it's two factors or three factors. And the models uh, do this iteratively on a day-by-day -day, um, basis, and so, we would, she would be able to ultimately be able to do this over time to see what the uh, model or predicted stress for seagrasses are. And the aim is that she would then um, be looking to characterise that and validate that in the field. So I'm sorry I ran over time. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free.